Hello everyone, I am Dr. Omkar Sangeeta Dilaprao Soroni from Team AFMG and today I am glad to welcome you all back to a very high yield and an important topic from the exam point of view as well as from clinical practice point of view. So this topic that is systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE that we abbreviate into is a most important topic from rheumatology from both aspects of pathology as well as medicine. So therefore it becomes for it becomes important that we discuss this topic in great details so let's dive into the topic okay so i will discuss both the pathology as well as the medicine aspects of sle because all of us well uh, like this disease is well known to all of us now so i hope that most of the points would just be a revision for all of you so if i talk about sle that is systemic lupus erythematosus so sle is an autoimmune condition right by the pathology we know that it is an autoimmune condition that means auto antibodies are formed uh, inside our body which will attack our self antigens or self organs so therefore please remember systemic lupus erythematosus is an autoimmune condition and it is a type of hypersensitivity so please remember auto antibodies attacking our auto uh, attacking our antigens so there would be a formation of immune complexes that is antigen antibody complexes also called as immune complexes so immune complex mediated hypersensitivity is nothing but type 3 hypersensitivity right so please remember sle is an example of type 3 hypersensitivity three letters type 3 hypersensitivity right please remember this if i talk about it more commonly affects with sex first of all so please remember SLE is predominantly seen in females. Okay, please remember SLE is predominantly encountered in females. Rather, the female is to male ratio is almost 9 is to 1. Okay, so please remember predominantly only female involvement is seen in cases of SLE. And if they ask you about the age group, so please remember usually young adolescent females are commonly affected with yes SLE. Okay, so please remember young adolescent females or young adolescent girls are commonly affected with SLE. Right? So if I talk about SLE, usually the patient will present to you with many systemic manifestations or systemic symptoms because SLE is a multi-system disorder. Okay, it is a rheumatological autoimmune disease, but it is a multi-system disorder because these autoantibodies produced inside our body will attack any organs. Okay, they will attack multiple organs and that can lead to all the following systemic manifestations that we'll discuss today, right? But before moving to the systemic manifestations or to the symptoms, I would first of all like to highlight the most important aspect of SLE and that is autoantibodies. These autoantibodies are the most important aspect of SLE because if we get these antibodies right then definitely SLE can become much simpler and much easier to remember. Okay, So let's discuss about these antibodies first and then dive into the clinical symptoms. So if I talk about the most sensitive and most specific antibodies which are the most uh, like uh, most commonly asked questions in your examination so please remember if i talk about the most sensitive antibody in sle the answer would be ana that is anti nuclear antibody so the most sensitive antibody in sle is ana that is anti nuclear antibody it is considered to be sensitive and not specific because of the reason that anti nuclear antibody is very much non specific as it is also found in other conditions okay as it is also found in other conditions like scleroderma and also in conditions of Jogren syndrome. So please remember as ANA is also found in other rheumatological conditions therefore it is not much specific to SLE but it is the most sensitive antibody for diagnosing SLE. If I talk about the next one that which is the most specific antibody then definitely your answer this time should be anti-Smith antibody. This time your answer should be anti-Smith antibody. So please remember it is easier to be remembered okay so most specific is anti-smith whereas most sensitive is anti-nuclear antibody if i talk about the next one now which autoantibody correlates with the disease activity okay so please remember then your answer should be anti-double stranded dna antibody anti-double stranded dna antibody so the titers of this anti-double stranded dna antibody keep on fluctuating okay and that is suggestive of the disease activity in the patient right high titers suggest that the patient is likely suffering from a SLE exacerbation. If I talk about next condition that is lupus cerebritis. 
Now, which antibody leads to this condition known as lupus cerebritis? Lupus cerebritis is nothing but the CNS manifestations of SLE, right? When the patient can present with cerebral edema, there would be headache in the patient, there would be seizures even, okay? So this condition is known as lupus cerebritis. But this lupus cerebritis is due to antibody, which is known as anti-neuronal antibody, okay? This is due to the antibody known as anti-neuronal antibody, which will attack the neurons in our central nervous system. System, further leading to the manifestations that I discussed now. The, then after that, the patient can also present with other cognition defects. Rather, please remember, in cases of SLE, lupus cerebritis would be a late CNS manifestation, whereas the earliest CNS manifestation would be just cognition defects. Okay, please remember that. If I talk about psychosis now, psychosis can also be seen in patients of SLE as a neuropsychiatric manifestation of SLE. So this psychosis is actually due to antibody which is known as anti-ribosomal P antibody. Okay, it is known as anti-ribosomal P antibody. Okay, please remember this. Anti-ribosomal P antibody is suggestive of psychosis, whereas if they talk about anti-ribonucleoprotein antibody, then that is what is positive in cases of multiple connective tissue disorder. Okay, if I talk about the next condition that is drug induced lupus now, drug induced lupus or we can say drug induced SLE. As we know, there is a group of drugs that we know by the abbreviation that is SHIP. Okay, this SHIP group of drugs are known to cause a very serious and an adverse effect that is SLE. Right. So these SHIP group of drugs, I hope you know from pharmacology, S goes for sulfonamides, which are antibiotics. H goes for hydralazine, antihypertensive. I goes for isoniazid, first line anti-tubercular agent. And P goes for prokinamide, that is an anti-arrhythmic drug. So now they can ask you which is the most common drug out of all which can lead to SLE. So please remember the most common SHIP drug which can further cause SLE is actually prokinamide. Okay, it is actually prokinamide, which is an anti-arrhythmic drug right so in cases of drug induced sle also it is due to an antibody which is produced and this autoantibody which is seen in cases of drug induced sle or drug induced lupus it is known as a antihistone antibody this was a question earlier please remember this okay so antihistone antibody is positive in cases of drug induced sle and this antihistone antibody would not attack the cns or it would not attack the renal system as well therefore in this patients of drug induced lupus there would no uh, no chances of there are no chances of lupus cerebritis or lupus nephritis therefore the patient would have a very good prognosis as compared to the other cases of sle right if i talk about the next one that is photosensitivity as we all know, in cases of SLE, there is an erythematous rash that is seen over the skin, okay? And whenever the patient steps out into the sun, due to the exposure to sunlight, there would be excessive erythematous rash as well as itching at times which would be present. So this is the photosensitivity phenomena which is linked with SLE. So please remember, this photosensitivity is due to an antibody which is known as anti-rho antibody, okay? It is known as an anti-rho antibody, which can also be remembered as a SSA antibody. Okay, we'll discuss about this uh, later also. Just remember photosensitivity is due to an antibody known as anti-rho antibody or SSA antibody. Whereas neonatal lupus, okay, neonatal lupus is also a condition which can be associated with anti-rho antibody. So now how neonatal lupus actually presents to you? So please remember this anti-rho antibody is actually a IgG type of antibody. Okay, so if a patient, if a female is a uh, uh, suffering from SLE and she is pregnant. So what happens? The patient would have this anti rho antibody. This anti rho antibody, as it is IgG type, it can easily cross the placenta. As it crosses the placenta, it can have some adverse effects on the fetus too. And therefore, the child can present with neonatal lupus. By neonatal lupus, I mean the child can present to you after birth with a butterfly or a malar rash. There can be presence of syncope. The child can present to you with syncope. There would be two important manifestations that would be. First of all, there will be a severe bradycardia in this patient and secondly, the child can even present, it, present to you with ECG findings of a complete heart block. Okay, there would be ECG findings of a complete heart block. And why this complete heart block actually occurs? So this anti rho antibody which is there, it will cross the placenta and it will attack the AV node of the fetus. Okay, it will attack the AV node of the fetus that would lead to conduction impairment inside the heart and that can further lead to complete hard walk in the neonate or the child okay i hope this is clear with everybody so 
in cases of SLE positive mothers, the child can also present with neonatal lupus due to an antibody which is known as anti rho antibody. Please remember this. If I move further, talking about the clinical features now, as we have discussed about most of the antibody, just remember all of those. If I talk about the clinical features, those can be remembered with a mnemonic boss are mad. Where first of all, B goes for the brain manifestations. Okay, brain that means CNS manifestations. And as we discussed, the most common CNS manifestations in a patient of SLE would not be lupus cerebritis, rather it would be only cognition defects. Okay, so the most common CNS manifestation in a patient of SLE would be cognition defects. Whereas a patient can also present in the later stages with lupus cerebritis features like cerebral edema, headache, seizures, and that is due to antibody called as anti-neuronal antibody, right? Please remember this, uh, these features are important to be remembered. If I talk about the next condition, O, O goes for oral aphthous ulcers. So please remember, oral aphthous ulcers are also seen in many other conditions, but in cases of SLE usually, these oral uh, aphthous ulcers would be pain, painless. Okay, so this oral aphthous ulcers would mainly be painless, but rarely they can also be painful. Rarely they can also be painful. Okay. So mainly the patient will present with a painless or recurrent oral ulcers. Usually the patient presents to you or gives you a history of almost uh, oral aphthous ulcers three or four times a year. So they come on a recurrent basis, but they are usually just <clears throat> managed with the help of a local application of steroids that is like benzocaine jelly or that can be used. If I talk about the next condition, but before moving, I just like to highlight painless oral aphthous ulcers on a recurrent basis. If they mention in a young adult female, your diagnosis definitely can be a silly. But if they talk about painful oral aphthous ulcers along with painful genital ulcers and some ocular manifestations at times, then your diagnosis moves to a syndrome which is known as Bechet syndrome. Okay, please remember if they talk about painful oral as well as genital ulcers, then the diagnosis is more likely in the favor of Bechet's disease and not SLE. All right? If I talk about serositis now, S goes for serositis. So serositis is inflammation of your serous cavities like pleural cavity or your pericardial cavity. Right? So please remember serositis would lead to some lung as well as heart manifestations that we'll discuss further. Okay, and all of these can be managed just with the help of steroids as they are autoimmune in origin. If I talk about the next S that is synovitis, this is the important part. Okay, please remember because the patient would more likely present to you with musculoskeletal manifestations like arthralgia or myalgia. Okay, therefore synovitis comes into <clears throat> uh, picture. So please remember previously for diagnosis of SLE, arthritis was included as a component or a diagnostic criteria. But nowadays it, they have clearly mentioned it as synovitis. Why? Because arthritis is usually termed where there would be associated deformities. But in cases of SLE, there were no deformities noticed in the patients. And therefore they have just mentioned it as synovitis, which is just the inflammation of the synovium, which lines your joints, right? So please remember, synovitis is inflammation of your joints in simple terms, if I could say, okay, and they would involve more than equal to two joints. That is two or more joints would be involved in this condition. Now the question can be, which type of joints are involved in cases of SLE synovitis? So please remember, they can be larger joints like the knee or the shoulder joint, or they can be even smaller joints like the PIP or the DIP joint, right? So any, now like any type of joints would be involved in this case, whereas the synovitis in this condition would be asymmetrical. Okay, it would be asymmetrical. Whereas bilaterally symmetrical synovitis or arthritis is commonly seen in cases of rheumatoid arthritis that we discussed earlier, right? Please remember this. If I talk about anemia, that is next one, that is anemia. So please remember, here you need to remember that in SLE, there can be two causes of anemia mainly. First of all, as we know, SLE is a chronic condition. Therefore, due to chronic course of the disease, the patient can present to you more commonly with the anemia called as anemia of chronic disease. Okay, so the patient can more commonly present to you with what is called as anemia of chronic disease. And in this, as we know on a peripheral smear, anemia of chronic disease, more commonly I'm saying, more commonly it presents as a normochromic normocytic anemia, right? So due to the chronic course, the patient can have anemia of chronic disease. But due to the autoantibodies that are produced in this patient, the patient also has chances of developing autoimmune hemolytic anemia okay 
So please remember the auto antibodies would be produced in this patient like the anti erythrocyte antibody which is produced which will attack own RBCs whereas anti erythropoietin antibody which is produced which will attack the erythropoietin and inhibit the erythropoiesis or RBC production and that is the reason why there are chances of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in this patient too. If I talk about the peripheral smear of autoimmune hemolytic anemia as we know there would be presence of spirocytes on the smear of autoimmune hemolytic anemia okay so don't get just surprised with looking at a peripheral smear showing you spirocytes in a patient of SLE okay that can also be present due to the presence of these autoantibodies which can further cause autoimmune hemolytic anemia right so if we are <clears throat> having spirocytes on a peripheral smear of a child then we are more likely suspecting hereditary spirocytosis but if we are looking for spirocytes on a peripheral smear of a young adult female with SLE like features then we are uh, actually thinking in terms of autoimmune hemolytic anemia right if we are suspecting autoimmune hemolytic anemia with the help of a peripheral smear then for further diagnosis definitely we can run a direct Coombs test and the DCT would be positive if autoimmune hemolytic anemia is present but if they ask you which is the more common type of anemia seen in SLE patients definitely your answer should be ACD that is anemia of chronic disease is much more common as compared to autoimmune hemolytic anemia right next talking about the renal manifestations now if I talk about the renal involvement rather it is the most important uh, <clears throat> system which is involved in cases of SLE because renal involvement or renal failure is the leading cause of death in cases of active SLE right so please remember if I talk about renal involvement usually the patient initially would be asymptomatic but as soon as the disease progresses the patient can present to you with gradual onset hypertension okay so every time there would be increased blood pressure on every visit of the patient along with that the patient can also complain or maybe the urine uh, uh, routine microscopic examination can give you presence of RBCs that is hematuria would be present in this patient and that can further even progress to proteinuria okay and as there is hematuria and proteinuria that means there is a glomeruli damage as we have discussed earlier also multiple times that in cases of SED also there is a glomerular damage there can be presence of nephritic or nephrotic syndrome in cases of SLE so here also we can uh, take a renal biopsy and just this can be stained with the help of a pass that is pyroidic acid shift stain so when we stain with pass definitely we can find something like this these are actually called as the wire loop lesions okay these are known as the wire loop lesions so wire loop lesions on a kidney biopsy are suggestive of lupus nephritis Okay, please remember lupus nephritis is nothing but the renal manifestations of SLE, right? So wire loop lesions are on a kidney biopsy are a feature of SLE or lupus nephritis. Whereas Kimmelstein Wilson nodules, I hope you remember Kimmelstein Wilson nodules are the characteristic features on a renal biopsy of diabetic nephropathy, right? Please remember these two commonly are the differential diagnosis which come in the question, right? If I talk about the next one that is extremities now okay this is actually just for the completion sake but you can remember uh, with this mnemonic as well so for extremities actually I'm talking about the lower limbs around the ankle usually you will find some small small bleeding spots known as petechiae okay and they can even enlarge in size and can form purpura so petechiae or purpura would be formed mainly around the ankles first okay they can progress further as, as well <clears throat> so these petechiae or purpura are actually due to the decrease in the platelet count that means there would be thrombocytopenia in this patient there is anemia there is thrombocytopenia also due to the auto antibodies that are produced along with that there would also be lymphopenia that means there would be destruction of WBCs even and lymphopenia can also be one of the reasons why this patient would develop uh, infections on a recurrent basis okay though the leading cause of infections in a patient of SLE is not lymphopenia rather it is the long-term therapy of steroids which is given to this patient which will lead to an immunocompromised state of this patient we'll discuss that further when I come to the treatment part okay so please remember this if I talk about the MAD then in the mnemonic M usually goes for a malar rash as I know like everybody of us is well acquainted with this malar rash okay when SLE comes to mind the first thing that comes to our mind is actually the malar rash which is also called as the butterfly rash right it is an erythematous rash which is seen over the face so but please remember this erythematous malar or butterfly rash it mainly involves the cheeks as well as the bridge of the nose okay it involves the cheeks as well as the bridge of the nose whereas 
it does not involve the nasolabial folds. There is pairing of the nasolabial folds which is seen. Whereas if I talk about a 40 year old female complaining dyspnea, chest pain, chest x-ray showing bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and along with that there is similar kind of uh, not erythematous but a purplish lesion which is seen on the face covering the cheeks, the bridge of the nose, the tip of the nose mainly as well as the nasolabial folds. So the rash is all over the face, okay, mainly involving the tip of the nose and the nasolabial folds. In that condition, the diagnosis would be go in the favor of sarcoidosis, right? So I hope you have made it clear. Please remember, in this condition, it does not involve the nasolabial folds. If I talk about the next condition, and please remember this malar or the butterfly rash is actually photosensitive. It exacerbates or increases when there is exposure to sunlight. If I talk about the A in the mnemonic, A goes for alopecia. Alopecia, that means hair loss. Now, in Dharma, there can be a question in SLE, which type of alopecia can be seen? So, if they ask you specifically about SLE, then usually we find a non-scarring or a non-psychiatrical type of alopecia. A non-scarring or a non-psychiatrical alopecia is usually seen in cases of SLE. But if they specifically mention about DLE, in DLE, we usually find scarring type of alopecia. In discoid lupus erythematosus, we usually find a scarring alopecia in the patient, right? If I talk about the D in the mnemonic, that is discoid rash. So discoid rash is usually something like this. Okay, it is a circular region with a hyperpigmented periphery and a hypopigmented central part. Hyperpigmented periphery hogi and hypopigmented central part would be there, and there would be loss of dermal appendages like the sweat glands or the sebaceous glands would be lost, and this is actually due to the phenomena known as atrophic scarring. There would be atrophic scarring is which is usually seen. So please remember, there is a scarring rash which is seen, but the alopecia is non-scarring. Okay, scarring rash can be seen, but alopecia would remain non-scarring. Please remember this. If I talk about the next one now, here I have completed the mnemonic, just once revising it uh, very quickly. Boss are mad, B for brain manifestations, like most commonly cognition defects, O for oral after ulcers, mainly painless, S goes for serositis, next S goes for synovitis, which is the most common manifestation, A goes for anemia, mainly anemia of chronic disease, R goes for renal manifestations, which can further progress to lupus nephritis, kidney biopsy showing viral lesions, E goes for extremities showing petechia or purpura, M goes for malar rash or a butterfly rash which is photosensitive A goes for alopecia which is non-scarring type and D goes for discoid rash which is actually a scarring type of rash right please remember this if I talk about the most common involvement as we have already discussed the most commonly involved system in this condition is actually the musculoskeletal system the musculoskeletal manifestations are the most common one we tend to remember that the dermatological manifestations like malar rash please remember they are not more common okay yes they are second most common but the most common type of involvement or manifestations which is seen it is due to involvement of the musculoskeletal system in form of arthralgia Okay, please remember in form of arthralgia or myalgia that is joint pain or muscle pain would commonly be seen in patients of SLE. Okay, the first complaints would usually be arthralgia or myalgia in these patients. If I talk about the next one now, which is the most common lung lesion? As I told you, lungs and heart would be involved due to inflammation of their serous cavities, right? So the most common lung lesion which is seen in this patient is usually pleuritis. Okay, it is usually pleuritis. Whereas the most common heart lesion which is seen, it is pericarditis. It is pericarditis. As I have discussed about pericarditis earlier also, the patient can present with a uh, chest pain, ECG showing ST elevation, but which is concave upwards. All of these features are suggestive of pericarditis. And along with that, on auscultation of pericardial friction rub would be heard. Right? If I talk about the least common now, if they are asking you most common, definitely there is a chance they can ask you the least common lung and heart manifestations. So the least common lung manifestation that is seen, it is actually known as a shrinking lung syndrome. It is known as a shrinking lung syndrome. Please remember it is known as a shrinking lung syndrome. Whereas if I talk about the least common heart manifestation, then your answer should be Libman Sachs endocarditis. I know. Though you have repetitively and commonly studied about Libman Sachs endocarditis associated with SLE, please remember it is the least common cardiac manifestation associated with SLE. Yes, it is important, it is different and therefore there is a high chance it can be asked. Okay, But it is the least common manifestation, not a commonest one. 
So please remember in Libman Sachs endocarditis, as we discussed in the previous video, there would be vegetations which would be formed on the valvular surfaces of heart. Mostly the under surface of the valves would be involved and that is the reason why these vegetations can damage the chordae tendine. And as the chordae tendine are damaged, there is a probability that the patient can develop valvular regions like mitral regurgitation and if a patient is presenting to you with symptomatic valvular regions like symptomatic mitral regurgitation then the treatment for this condition shall be valvuloplasty then the treatment of choice shall be valvuloplasty and not steroids please remember definitely we can give steroids for multiple other conditions okay like for example this anemia like autoimmune hemolytic anemia can be managed with the help of steroids in this patient okay the oral aphthous ulcers can be managed with the help of applying local steroids in this condition serocytis sinovitis like components would respond very uh, well to the steroids part but please remember the Limbans sacs endocarditis, if it is presenting with valvular lesions, definitely we will need a valvuloplasty and you should not give any steroids to this patient then. If I talk about the diagnosis now, in diagnosis, please remember at least four features should be present. Okay, so more than equal to four features should be positive more than equal to four features should be present as we have discussed about two types of features one were the laugh features that is all your uh, antibodies that were present along with that there would be low um, low level of complement c3 levels would be low okay please remember along with that the presence of all the other antibodies that we have discussed right so those were your laugh features as well as there would be some clinical features that we have discussed with the demonic boss are mad right so both of these should be present so please remember minimum four symptoms or four features should be present out of which at least one should be a lab feature and at least one should be a clinical feature. Okay, one should be a lab and one should be a clinical feature. That means one lab plus three clinical or one clinical plus three lab. Any way it can work, but at least four features should be present with this criteria, right? Then if I talk about the drug of choice as we know in steroids usually the drug of choice are steroids as it is an autoimmune condition but there are certain conditions where steroids are avoided or contraindicated in patients of sle if i talk about those conditions the first condition that i already discussed was Lyman sachs endocarditis with a symptomatic valvular lesion like mitral regurgitation in this condition usually the treatment of choice would be valvuloplasty and not steroids if I talk about the next condition in cases of photosensitivity also, please remember in photosensitivity also, steroids are usually contraindicated in this patient. If I talk about the next condition, <clears throat> please remember in cases of, sorry, in cases of SLE along with photosensitivity in multiple other conditions also steroids are absolutely contraindicated. So at least you should remember these two conditions that is Lyman Sachs endocarditis with a mitral regurgitation as well as photosensitivity in this conditions we generally don't give steroids and the third important condition where steroids are not absolutely contraindicated they can be given but it can be pregnancy why I'll discuss it further if I talk about the treatment part now the drug of choice for SLE is definitely steroids as we have discussed already but if they talk about SLE in pregnancy, as we discussed, they are, uh, steroids are actually not contraindicated, but they are not preferred in cases of SLE in pregnancy. Why? Please remember it is not due to a fact that all of us tend to remember that steroids lead to immunocompromised state. Pregnancy is already immunocompromised state. Therefore, steroids are contraindicated. No. Steroids are contraindicated because of the reason that the placental enzymes, the placental enzymes will deactivate the steroids and as they will deactivate the steroids, steroids would not have any role in cases of SLE in pregnancy. Therefore, in cases of SLE in pregnancy, we prefer a drug like hydroxychloroquine. A DMARD like hydroxychloroquine is generally preferred in cases of SLE in pregnancy. I hope this is fine with everybody. Just remember this. If I talk about now, after the treatment part, if I talk about the most common causes of mortality in SLE. So the most common cause of death in cases of active SLE when the patient is having a exacerbation of SLE or the patient is presenting to you with renal involvement okay, or all other systemic manifestations. In cases of active SLE, the most common cause of death would be the renal involvement that is lupus nephritis. Okay, the most common cause of death in active SLE is actually lupus nephritis. But if they talk about most common cause of death in early years of SLE, when a patient is just diagnosed with SLE, maybe in the first decade of diagnosis, okay, in the early years, or maybe if a patient is taking therapy for long term now, okay, if a patient is on steroids already, so uh, steroids can further lead to immunocompromised state, and therefore the patient can be prone to developing 
recurrent infections so please remember if they talk about most common cause of death in early years of sle or maybe on a law on in a patient with long-term therapy of steroids in both these conditions the leading cause of death would be infections the leading cause of death would be infections whereas if they change their statement that the patient of sle in the later stages or maybe when a patient is more than 45 years old then the cause of mortality in this patients would be accelerated atherosclerosis okay then the cause of death would be accelerated atherosclerosis as we know accelerated atherosclerosis is also a leading cause of death in patients of rheumatoid arthritis please remember this right whereas this was all about sle that you need to remember please remember the antibodies at any cost okay whereas if i talk about the antibody related conditions okay in which uh, we can find some other antibodies and you tend to get confused uh, with these antibodies also just i'll simplify it for you at least remember the antibodies from these conditions these three are most important first is jogren syndrome sometimes they call it as s jogren syndrome so in jogren syndrome also called as keratoconjunctivitis sicka sometimes here usually the patient main complaints would be a dry mouth and a dry eyes right so here in h jogren syndrome the two important antibodies that you need to remember are anti ro antibody also called as ssa antibody whereas the second one being the anti la antibody also called as the ssb antibody right so anti ro and anti la antibodies are positive in cases of s jogren syndrome right please remember this and anti ro antibody was also seen in cases of sle as we know right anti ro antibody was leading to photosensitivity as well as it was also causing neonatal lupus right if i talk about scleroderma now scleroderma which is also called as systemic sclerosis when the patient will present with uh, leather like skin pinched faces microstomia all of these features esophageal dis dysmotility they can be sclerodactyly in this condition in cases of diffuse scleroderma the antibody which is positive is known as anti topo isomerase antibody okay so uh, anti topo isomerase antibody is positive in cases of diffuse scleroderma whereas in cases of localized scleroderma the antibody which is seen is known as anti centromere antibody it is known as anti centromere antibody in cases of localized scleroderma whereas if i talk about rheumatoid arthritis the last condition in rheumatoid arthritis please remember it is your anti ccp antibody that is anti cyclic citrulin peptide antibody which is positive rather it is the investigation of choice for rheumatoid arthritis right so with this i come to an end of this session thank you so much for being attentive throughout the session and i hope this was beneficial for you i'll meet you in the next session with a very important and a high yield topic from another subject till then goodbye good luck and thank you so much let's meet in another session